Welcome. I hope you are having a wonderful night, dear viewer. Tonight, I will be telling some terrifyingly scary stories. Make sure to leave your feedback on the comments so I can make this the best experience for you. And if you have any stories you would like me to tell, you can send them through the link in the description. Let's begin. I used to live with my dad before I moved to a new city with my mom. The reasons for moving are not related to the story. I live in the UK. As a teenager, maybe I would be left home alone a lot of the time until the early hours of the morning due to my dad being out with their friends. I was fine with this. I would usually sit and play games or watch movies until he came home. On this specific night, I think it was a Friday, I had finished watching my movie bring it on for anyone wondering, and had gone upstairs to my bedroom to lay in bed watching YouTube videos. I don't remember what time I fell asleep, but I wasn't expecting my dad home until at least 2 a.m. The village I lived in at this time wasn't necessarily a great area and had a lot of crime, usually car incidents, teenage gang-related violence, and robberies, mainly from sheds in the garden, not usually the houses. I woke up when my dad got home, but didn't mention anything, obviously because I didn't even think anything of it anymore. When we both woke up in the morning and went out into the garden, which, by the way, is very long, maybe 200 yards, but not very wide, we saw that our bike tires had been stolen. They were locked in the shed, and someone had broken the lock off and taken the bike tires and the bike seats. At this point, I tell my dad what I heard, and he calls the police. They can't really do much, and don't really do much, besides make a statement. That day, I went to different stores with my dad to find motion-activated lights and cameras for the back garden. We found it all, and my dad installed the lights, but didn't install the cameras as he was waiting for some longer cables he had ordered online. Nothing happened for a few days, and it was time for me to go and stay at my mom's for the weekend. I packed my bags and was picked up by her. Nothing eventful happened to me while I was gone. When I got back to my dad's, he had installed the cameras. He had also spoken to the police again. I asked what had happened. While I was gone and my dad was out with his friends, someone had tried to break into the house. The camera posted slightly down the garden, but the light only reached the back patio area, so we couldn't see further than that. The footage was dark, and for some reason, the light hadn't come on yet. We saw small movements in the darkness coming up to the door. The light turns on, and a man in a black hoodie looks up and covers his head with his arm, probably not expecting the light. He turns and runs down the garden very quickly after the light comes on. My dad had gotten home, gone to sleep, woken up the next morning, looked at the footage, and then went to check outside. There were dirty boot marks on the back door where someone had tried to kick it down. A little further down the garden, however, we had a washing line across the yard. Below the washing line was a large skid mark. The only thought was that the intruder had run down the garden and choked themselves on the washing line, not knowing it was there, throwing them to the ground. A funnier ending to the story. While it might not be scary to meet people as a 13-year-old, knowing that the first time I was alone, it was probably the same person, looking back. It's scary knowing what would have happened if I had been home alone and they had gotten in. Luckily, it seemed they only wanted to break in while no one was there. I woke up very suddenly at about 1 a.m., not knowing if something had actually woken me up or not until I heard a loud sound in my back garden. My room was on the front of the house, so I couldn't see anything from there. I stayed in bed and just assumed it was a neighbor or something in their garden that wasn't actually in my garden. I went back to sleep, Growing up, my family and I lived in a nice, clean neighborhood. I was a normal kid who had normal friends who went to a normal school. I lived a pretty normal life, like many kids do. I was only 11 years old at the time of this story. I would say I had a strong relationship with my dad growing up. We would do the basic father-son activities like fishing, dirt biking, playing football, and baseball. He would teach me how to cook steak and how to hunt. 
Overall, I would say I love my dad a lot. My mom, on the other hand, was always quiet. I can't recall a single memory that I have with her that brings joy to my heart. She was always crying, and if she wasn't crying, then she would be angry. If she wasn't feeling either of those emotions, then she would have this pale look on her face that tells you, I don't want anything to do with you. I never had a single decent conversation with her. She hated me. It felt like everything I ever did was wrong. I was never good enough for her, and neither was dad. She looked at me with disgust in her eyes, as if I had done something horrible to her. It's like my dad and I had a cold-hearted roommate living in our house with us. Every summer growing up, we would drive up north towards the woods to camp out in our second house that we had. This was our getaway house that we had in case of a disaster, but it was also a vacation spot. I hated this place. Everything about it was so off. It was always cold, and not a normal cold, but a weird, always foggy kind of cold. The kind of cold that reminds you of mold you could never see the sun, and the house itself was surrounded by trees. It was like a house you'd use for typical horror movies. It was old. The floors were creaky, and the walls felt like they were about to collapse. The attic had a lot of dusty old photographs of my parents that I liked going through. They looked happy. Some photographs were torn apart as if someone else was in them. The house always had a weird, sour stench to it every time we would visit. Although I hated everything about this place, it was the one thing that made mom happy. Wood's house is what my dad and I called it. Summer was now rolling around and school was finishing up. Dad and mom were arguing. Well, dad was trying to talk to mom and yet mom wasn't responding. I was upstairs in my room when I overheard their conversation. Why do we have to go there every year? Haven't you gotten sick of that place yet? Dad, clearly frustrated, shouted. He continued, you need to let it go already. It's been 19 years now. I didn't hear a reply from mom but I could clearly envision the cold, pale expression she had on her face. Moments later, I hear my dad walking up the stairs in the direction of my room. He turned the handle that leads into my room and slowly opened the door to check if I was awake. I didn't mean to wake you, says dad, after I made eye contact with him. You're okay. I wasn't sleeping anyway, I replied. He gave me a soft, reassuring smile and continued, we're going to head to the Woods house this weekend. Make sure you're packed by tomorrow night. He breaks eye contact with me and looks at the floor as what seemed like sorrow filled his eyes. Now go to sleep. It's getting late. He slowly turns around and shuts the door behind him as he walks out. I could hear him make his way toward their bedroom, which was across the hallway upstairs. It was Thursday night, so that means that I have to be packed by Friday night to head to the Woods house on Saturday. After some time had passed, I could hear mom walking up the stairs, really slowly and really quietly. I could hear her steps slowly creeping closer outside my door. All of a sudden, they stopped. I could see the shadows of her feet standing outside my door. My door was shut, but I was convinced that she was just outside it. It weirded me out that she didn't come in. So I got out of bed to open the door just to see that no one was there in the first place. I doubted my own judgment and headed back to bed. I woke up to the sound of my alarm ringing at 9. 0 a.m. I struggled getting out of bed, fighting sleep like never before. Moments later, I finally got up to go brush my teeth and take a shower. While I was getting ready for the day, there was only one thing on my mind. I couldn't help but think about how badly I didn't want to go. I finished getting ready in the bathroom as my dad peered around the corner. Did you get a chance to pack yet? He asks me while holding his, what I'm assuming to be, packed suitcase. I simply shook my head, telling him no, and walked towards my room to start packing. He then follows me to my room and leans against the doorway, watching me as I start to pack. You know, I'm sorry about all of this. He says it in a calm voice, trying to get me to look up at him. I know how much you hate that place, but we also both know how much it means to mom. Besides, we'll get to go hunting together. 
decides we'll get to go hunting together. It feels like it's been ages. I looked up at him with a blank expression on my face and went back to packing. He lets out a sigh and walks out of my room to go downstairs. Moments later, I hear him talking to mom, but I can't make sense of anything they are saying. I finished packing my suitcase and said to myself, toothbrush, toothpaste, deodorant, listing the things that I'd been meaning to get with me. I tend to forget things, so this helps me a lot. I make my way down the stairs with my suitcase and backpack that I pack. I turn toward the corridor and make my way to the kitchen. I spot my mom at the counter, cutting veggies for what I assume would become a salad. And before I could say a word, I could tell she heard me walk in. She stopped dead in her tracks, her back facing me. It's as if she went into complete shock with the way she stood so still with the knife in her hand. Hesitantly, I say, Hey, have you seen the keys to the car? I'm trying to put my stew. Before I could finish saying what I wanted to say, she instantly jerked her head to her left and looked at the keys that were visibly laying on the counter, 10 feet away from her. I felt chills climb down my spine just from seeing her cold stare. I made my way over to the counter and through my peripheral vision, I could see her head slowly turn back to the cutting board and knife that were in her hand, and she started chopping again. Her chopping was so slow, but so loud. I grabbed the keys off the counter as fast as I could and walked out of the kitchen to make my way toward the garage. I met dad in the garage and handed him the keys. He opened the trunk, took my suitcase and backpack and put them inside. You know, I think we're going to have a lot of fun. I hope so, I replied. There was a moment of silence before I spoke again. How come mom bothers to talk to you? but not when it comes to me. It's as if she wants nothing to do with me. I pick up my head to look him in the eyes for an answer. By the look on my dad's face after hearing what I just said, you could tell he wanted to say something that's been bugging him. But instead, he just said, maybe she just has a lot on her mind. He shut the trunk and made his way to the front seat, pulling out his phone from his pocket to find the address of that godforsaken place. I sat in the back seat as we both waited for mom to come join us in the car. Everything was fine until the local kids started going missing. My family lives in a rich area. Both my parents are very successful stockbrokers and money has never been a concern for us. They retired a couple years ago and now generally spend their time socializing with the locals in our area. My parents are both quite charming and easygoing. And generally speaking, they've been fairly popular for as long as I can remember. They're considered pillars of the community, often hosting dinners and get togethers and all sorts of little events attended by all the elites of the area. So I've become fairly well acquainted with the other pretentious rich people who live here. I generally spend those little events pulling faces at my friend Alex silently joking about how stupid we thought everyone at these parties was. There's been a sudden spike in the number of missing person cases involving children in our area in the last two years. Seven children are missing. My parents, like any parents would be, were worried for me and told me all the usual things. Don't go anywhere alone. Get home before dark. Keep your parents informed about your whereabouts. You know, fairly standard stuff. I wasn't worried fairly normal for a child, you know. I didn't know any of the missing kids. So the news reports just seemed like stories and the parental warnings seemed irrelevant. Who knew if whoever was snatching kids was still at it? And besides, surely nobody would attack me and Alex if we went everywhere together. Safety is in numbers, like my parents said. That was our reasoning for deciding to have one final race that evening. Even as the sun had started to set in the sky, we took off running. Alex was in front and I was just behind him, straining to catch up with his bubblegum pink t-shirt. I kept telling him it was a terrible color. Nobody else wore it, but he never listened to me. We sprinted to the tree line that represented the finish at top speed. I was really pushing myself, trying to beat Alex. So when the black robed figure stepped out from a tree right in front of me and tripped me over, my momentum made sure I had no chance. I went flying face first into the dirt, 
completely in shock over what had just happened, before fear really started to seep in. We'd been idiots. They have us now. We were probably both going to die somewhere around here, and our bodies would be on a coroner's table right afterwards. As the terror mounted, I scrambled to my feet and spun around, only to see nothing. The black-robed figure was gone. So was Alex. When I told my parents about what happened, they went ballistic. How could I have stayed out late, disobeying one of the very few, very simple rules that I should have been listening to? Never go out in the dark. Surely I had to shoulder some of the blame for his disappearance. My parents reported it, and I was questioned by the cops. I gave them answers to the questions they asked as best I could, enough for them to launch into a search and rescue for Alex. I participated in the search, but we couldn't find him. Two years passed. We were about to move to a different neighborhood, so we were packing and boxing up all our stuff. My parents were both upstairs, reminiscing over an old photo album that mom had found a few years prior. While I started putting away books in a large box labeled book, I looked at the box and it looked far too empty. I knew we had more books. Then I remembered that the rest of it was probably in the basement. My dad generally kept the basement locked, but on this occasion he must have forgotten. What with all the excitement of moving out, the door creaked open and I stepped inside. There were a couple of neatly stacked rows of boxes right in front of me, so I went to pick one of them up. A slightly discolored patch of the wall caught my eye as I leaned over the row of boxes. I tapped at it with a couple of fingers to check if it was damp, but it was perfectly dry. When I tapped it, the discolored part of the wall slid outward, revealing itself to be a secret compartment of sorts. I was intrigued. What secrets were my parents keeping here? I picked up the little box in the compartment and opened it, and at that moment, my life changed forever. Inside the box were little Ziploc plastic bags, each containing what looked like a strip of cloth. And as I picked one up and opened it up, a few strands of hair fell out, along with a photograph. I looked at the photograph, trying to remember where I'd seen it before, and then I remembered the news broadcasts from two years ago. It was one of the missing kids. Ignoring the absolutely sickening feeling in my gut, I rummaged through the Ziploc bags, and then I saw the one that confirmed it. The bubblegum pink that I'd never seen anyone else wear the brown hair, and the picture of Alex. My parents had abducted the missing kids two years ago. With shaking fingers, I picked up the strands of hair on ground that I could see and stuffed them back in the Ziploc bag, put it all back in place, and ran. My parents were still upstairs. I heard Dad yell and ask if I was done boxing up the books. I said yes, and he came down and looked into the box before coming to the same conclusion I had. This box was nowhere near full enough. Inwardly cursing myself for not taking the books to the basement, I asked him what we should do. He said he'd go to the basement and bring out the rest. My father is a smart man. He saw my face, already pale, drained completely of color. He looked at the box of books and saw the white spots where all the chalk from the basement had gotten on the flaps. I saw him put two and two together. I heard him yell for my mother as I ran out of the house. I heard him yell in frustration that I'd taken the car keys. I drove for what felt like hours, somehow keeping myself under the speed limit, drove over the state border, ditched the car, got a rental and got a rental and got a motel. I can't go to the police. I have no evidence, and accusing one of the richest men in the state of being responsible for one of the worst crimes in the state's last decade would just get me laughed at and make it easier for them to find me. I don't know what to do. But for now, I'm looking over my shoulder 